It's nice to be back in uh, Hobart. I, I think I'm going to make this a yearly pilgrimage. This is my second time in two years coming down and presenting. And I'm, uh, I was going to say I'm the token Protestant speaker, but Lyle Shelton's joining us uh, this year. And, and I don't know if there's any other token Protestants out there as well, but... <laughs> I'm sure Hayden will pull me up again. Uh, Hayden's good at doing that. He, last year he asked me some good questions about science as well. So just so you know, David, you're not the only person that Hayden has wanted to take the task on some uh, science generalizations, but that's okay. I, I enjoyed it and I'm sure I'll enjoy whatever Hayden wants to talk to me about after this as well. <laughs> and everybody else, because I'm not a student of politics. Uh, and so I'm gonna approach the conversation today coming from what I am a student of, which is literature. And so my talk may begin a little bit unexpected, uh, unexpectedly, considering that the purpose of today is to talk about uh, freedom of speech. For what, it could be asked, does a modern day conception of the right to freedom of speech have to do with two of the greatest epic poems ever written? And what specifically does it have to do with Satan? I was at uh, dinner last night uh, talking to uh, some friends of mine uh, from Queensland, and they said, what are you talking about tomorrow night, uh, tomorrow? And I said, Satan. I said it very loudly, and they, <laughs> they looked around and were concerned, and I said, my understanding of Hobart is that there's a lot of people here who are a big fan of his work. <laughs> I think that's what I understand of whatever the dark mofo thing is, but I trust as the talk progresses uh, that uh, the connection will be revealed, or if nothing else, it's always fun to talk about the epic poetry of Milton and Dante. So we're going to begin in the first book of John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost, in which the reader is hurled headlong into the fiery lake of hell to witness the awakening of Satan. Laying vanquished, rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded though immortal, surrounded only by the flames of hell, yet from those flames no light, but rather darkness visible, serving only to discover lights, uh, sights of woe, Satan proclaims the first of what will become many rebellious orations the likes of which have led countless critics over the centuries to side with Satan, viewing him as the hero of the grand epic. After landing on a dreary plain, forlorn, wild and desolate, Satan glories to have escaped the lake and proclaims to his companion Beelzebub probably the most famous passage in the entire poem. Farewell, happy fields where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors, hail, infernal world, and thou profoundest hell receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. What matter where, if I be still the same, and what I should be all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater? Here at least we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here for his envy, will not drive us hence, here we may reign secure. And in my choice, to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. It's my belief that these are some of the most profound, illuminating and dangerous words ever written. And while it may not at first be apparent, they are words that hold direct relevance for freedom of speech. What I intend to demonstrate is that freedom is a slippery term not only is demonstrated through the contrasting definitions of negative and positive liberty, but also through the recognition that a certain definition of freedom is, to put it most bluntly, satanic. And therefore, when campaigning for freedom and the modern idea of the right to freedom of speech, we're treading the boundary between heaven and hell. And if tempted to cross this threshold, like Dante, we should abandon all hope, we who enter here. As I mentioned, many critics Things just moved. Many critics emerging perhaps unsurprisingly from the dynamism and radicalism that typified the Romantic movement have identified Satan as the true hero of Paradise Lost. The famous words of William Blake are that the reason Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote of angels and God and at liberty when he wrote of the devils and hell is because he was a true poet and of the devil's party without knowing it. The poet laureate Robert Southey places advocates of this response in the ignominiously titled Satanic School. A school that it could, I think, be argued still exists to this day, exemplified perhaps by Paul Alinsky, uh, Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, which includes an introductory acknowledgement to, as he put it, the very first radical, 
from all our legends, mythology and history, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. What is it in the character of Satan that radical thinkers such as Blake and Alinsky find so attractive? My suggestion is that it is exactly Satan's use of the word free. As Alinsky says, Satan has indeed won his own kingdom, at least according to his perspective, in his opening address to Beelzebub, in which he claims that it is better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Here at least, he says, while suffering eternal torment and despair, a point that we cannot forget, here at least we shall be free. Free in hell. After saying farewell to happy fields where joy forever dwells and recognising that his new life will contain only despair, here at least we shall be free. I think this perplexing approach to the concept of freedom illustrates the problematic breadth of the scope for the word's definition. Freedom means a great many things and is defined variously by a great many people. Satan's ideal freedom is here defined in one specific way, merely by a lack of overt service to God, regardless of the fact that God is a benevolent, all-powerful and loving leader. To bend the knee at all is in Satan's mind the great tragedy, and thus Satan's unconquerable will is, is seen as a heroic triumph. So while Satan as hero has been a mainline critical response for over two centuries, C.S. Lewis combated it in his book, A Preface to Paradise Lost, in which he points out that Satan is never happy, always unfulfilled, always in despair, always in torment, a truth that's also articulated powerfully in Stanley Fisher's book, Surprised by Sin. In short, to see Satan as a heroic overcomer is to look at him through rose-coloured glasses. Satan is a liar, and he lies to himself and to the reader. As Lewis points out, Milton did not foresee that his work would one day meet the disarming simplicity of critics who take for gospel things said by the father of falsehood in public speeches to his troops. These are indeed lies, and Satan, in his better moments, if the Prince of Darkness can have better moments, knows them to be lies. His torment is complete because he has made a hell for himself, and therefore he is always in hell. He recognises this upon apparently escaping from hell and being on the outskirts of earth reflecting on the love of heaven. Be then his love, that's God's love, be then his love accursed, he says to himself, since love or hate to me alike it, de it deals eternal woe. But immediately upon saying this, he realises that it is not love that should be accursed, but himself, since against God's will, Satan chose freely what he now so justly rues. He is miserable and he knows he cannot escape his infinite despair. In a moment of blinding clarity, which he soon chooses to forget, Satan says, which way I fly is hell, myself am hell. Such a recognition makes perfect sense considering his initial proclamation to have brought a mind with him not to be changed by place or time. His mind goes with him wherever he is, and he has an illogical faith in his mind's capacity to make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. Unfortunately for Satan, it sounds strange to say that, but unfortunately for Satan, he's only understood half of the equation. He cannot make a heaven of hell, but he can certainly make a hell on earth because he himself is hell. This is the all important background when we remember that Satan believed in his freedom. He believed that he had achieved it. He had not been free in heaven and he now believes that he has escaped the rule of God. But this freedom is obviously a poor imitation of true freedom. It is in fact only another form of servitude. Rather than serving God, he is instead enslaved to himself. Enslaved paradoxically, precisely by his desire for freedom. This paradox is illustrated in that other great epic about heaven and hell, Dante's Divine Comedy. I should say about purgatory as well, shouldn't I? 
which paints an altogether less romantic picture of Satan. Rather than dynamically and charismatically assembling the hordes of demons in the halls of pandemonium, whipping them into a frenzy and then setting off courageously into the unknown to corrupt God's newest creation, Dante's devil is instead hopelessly inert. As the poet and his guide Virgil journey to the bottom of hell, they find themselves walking along the frozen river Cocytus, a strong cold wind blowing towards them as they make their way to its source. The river opens out into a wide lake, and in the centre of the lake, the giant form of Lucifer sits frozen up to his waist in ice, ceaselessly beating his wings in his attempt to escape. Underneath each arm came forth two mighty wings, such as befitting were so great a bird. Sails of the sea I never saw so large. No feathers had they, but as of a bat their fashion was, and he was waving them so that three winds proceeded forth therefrom, thereby Cocytus was congealed. With six eyes did he weep, and down three chins trickled the teardrops and the bloody drivel. It's an amazing scene. Satan remains frozen in his lake, in his punishment, doomed for all eternity, and his three faces constantly weep tears as he struggles in vain to break free of the ice by the power of his giant wings. But of course, it is exactly this which keeps him frozen. The beating of those wings forces gales of wind down onto the lake, freezing it solid and keeping him forever a prisoner of unyielding ice. It is his desire for freedom that keeps him captive. He is literally enslaved by his obsession with freedom on his terms. And that's the crux of the issue, those three words, on his terms. While at first Milton's Satan appears vastly different and heroically superior to Dante's, they are ultimately the same. Enslaved by their obsession with freedom on their terms, neither of them is free. Neither of them will ever be free. And it is precisely because they're so obsessed with freedom that they will never achieve it. This is the image that I want to foreground as I discuss freedom of speech this morning. And to tackle this, I want to address three distinct points. First, the difference between positive and negative liberty is largely undiscussed these days amongst the rank and file. But this distinction is vital in recognising some of the pitfalls of obsessing over freedoms and rights in general. Second, libertarianism and liberalism have become strange bedfellows for conservatism over recent decades. Strange, of course, because their interests only occasionally overlap and unconstrained liberalism is obviously counter to conservatism. It's self-destructive. The image that I use is the ancient symbol of an Ouroboros, which is the snake eating its own tail. <coughs> liberalism suffers from the self-destruction as one freedom devours all others, and we're faced in the end with what James Corb called the tyranny of liberalism. Finally, I will suggest a potential remedy found in recognising the right place of freedom in a hierarchy of goods, and spoiler alert, it's not at the top, and the need to surround it and define it through the virtues, those long neglected and maligned pointers to true reality. So we venture now into the territory of positive and negative liberty, and I'm well aware that there'll be others in this room eminently more qualified than myself to discuss these, so I accept your grace in advance for any aspects I've overlooked or misrepresented and look forward to question time at the end during which I can be corrected. Hopefully though, I will not be led astray by the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy for my definitions. Negative liberty is the absence of obstacles, barriers or constraints. One has negative liberty, liberty to the extent that actions are available to one in this negative sense. Positive liberty is the possibility of acting or the fact of acting in such a way as to take control of one's life and realise one's fundamental purposes. So the article goes on to give the illustration of a person driving on a road, choosing freely at each intersection, first to turn left and then right. There are no other cars on the road and so these, these choices are obviously made without obstacle or impediment. And this is an example of negative freedom as nothing got in the driver's way. However, the situation is immediately seen in a different light if it is revealed that the driver is speeding to the store to buy a packet of cigarettes, deeply addicted and knowing that the, the tobacconist will close any minute. 
rather than driving, he feels as if he is being driven. This is the distinction between negative and positive freedom. Negative because it implies the absence of something, that's the absence of obstacles. And positive because it requires the presence of something that is self-mastery or self-determination. So in our earlier examples, Satan is celebrating negative liberty. He has escaped the bonds of servitude to God, or so he deceives himself into thinking. However, he has not discovered any form of positive liberty. He is instead driven internally further into himself, further into hell and despair. And Dante's depiction is even clearer. Satan's wings illustrate exactly the competition between the two forms of liberty. They beat to be free, negative freedom. Their beating keeps them enslaved, a lack of positive freedom. Therefore, we can see that by pursuing only negative freedom, one ends up being caught between these two competing forms of liberty, resulting in a stagnant, despairing stasis. And I'd like to suggest that until we understand these distinctions, our society too will be stuck between these conceptions of liberty. In fact, it's exactly where we find ourselves today. Never arriving at any kind of true freedom, suffering like Satan, our desire to be free enslaves us. As the Ouroboros devours its own tail, our freedoms consume themselves. And there is, I think, a really good reason for this. It's because freedom is impossible. If we're sloppy with our terms, if we conceive of freedom in the same way as Satan, there simply is no such thing as pure, complete, unimpeded freedom. For in what way can a human possibly ever be free? We are by definition born into a world of limitations, for to be human is to be limited. The transhumanists, for example, recognise this and are so therefore trying to escape that major limitation that we have, which is the limitation of our biology. They want to escape from our biology. Even within the domain of Christian theology, in which concepts of freedom, such as the freedom found in Christ, are obviously commonplace, negative freedom, that is, to be completely unimpeded by any obstruction of limitation, is impossible. We are created beings, and as such, we are subject to our creator, living within the limitations natural to our createdness. As Romans 9, 20, 21 states, but who are you? O oh man, to answer back to God. Will what is moulded say to its moulder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? For while Jesus promises freedom, it is caught up in that beautiful mystery, the wisdom of God that is folly to man, the seeming contradiction that to gain our lives we must lose them. To become our true selves, we must stop seeking ourselves, and to be truly free, we must become bond slaves of Christ. If it is freedom that we yearn for the most, if we place it upmost in our hierarchy of goods, we will always be caught between these two competing conceptions of freedom, beating our wings in the ice. And thus, I must admit at the beginning of a day committed to discussing it, I struggle a little with the concept of freedom of speech. On the one hand, I completely acknowledge that it is a valuable and necessary condition, uh, condition of the harmonious life of the polis. But on the other hand, I recognise it was, at least in part, exercising this freedom that transformed Lucifer into Satan. <laughs> My reasons for this struggle come through recognising some of the inherent contradictions that lie at its heart. For example, I want to reflect on a recent podcast interview with Campbell Newman. I don't know if all the people in Tasmania know who Campbell Newman is, but Queenslanders certainly know who he is. Newman stood for the Senate in uh, the recent election under the Liberal Democrats and their website contains their Freedom Manifesto which includes the need for a free speech constitutional amendment. And this is what it says, quote, Free speech is too important to be left to the whim of politicians. The Liberal Democrats would campaign to add the following to the Australian Constitution. Parliament shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And I guess that sounds 
Kind of good. As a religious person, I can get behind that. However, I must also point out that Newman's liberalism is nothing if not consistent. For in the interview, when questioned about his liberal credentials, which were rightly to be doubted, considering his crackdown on motor motorcycle gangs when he was the Premier of Queensland, he responded by pointing out that his liberalism is particularly evident in social issues. He responded by saying, quote, my attitude is that I don't want people to tell me how to live my life. That's why I backed gay marriage when I was the leader of the opposition in the LNP. That's why I backed voluntary assisted dying. I don't know why people feel that they have the right to tell other people how to live their lives." End quote. Of course, he did later in the episode follow this up with the fact that he supports a Judeo-Christian bedrock of our government, our law, our business culture, whatever that means. What we see here is unfortunately the common result of liberalism. Freedom is simply not specific enough. I would argue it's not good enough to be one's main cause because inevitably and unescapably, soon enough, one freedom will be forced up against another one in a winner-takes-all fight to the death. Quite seriously, at the end of such a competition, one of the two competing freedoms will be destroyed. This is a point that campaigners for new freedoms always reject during their campaign. For example, it was consistently denied throughout the same-sex marriage debate that this new freedom extended to same-sex attracted people would have any impact upon heterosexuals. They said, what has it got to do with you? In a 2015 article in The Australian, the then Australian Human Rights Commissioner Tim Wilson wrote the following, quote, in advancing equality before the law, religious freedom must also be preserved. Doing so will ensure any reform does not become a Trojan horse for legally enforced anti-religious secularism. Some people wrongly argue that religious freedom ends at the temple door. It doesn't, in the same way sexual orientation doesn't end at the bedroom door. But a necessary precondition for your rights being respected is that you must respect the rights of others. If religious Australians want the law to preserve religious marriage and be free to act consistent with their conscience, then they cannot concurrently deny same-sex couples a civil marriage." End quote. I think these are very interesting statements to reflect upon five years after the legalising of same-sex marriage. Wilson's belief that it would be possible to create a law in which, quote, neither side gets everything they want because accommodating competing human rights isn't a zero-sum game, end quote, has proven to be false. His suggestion that same-sex couples would be able to marry and others would be free to define marriage according to their faith or conscience without fear of legal retribution is being proven false time and time again, such as the nine months of legal action taken against the Archbishop and the Don't Mess With Marriage booklet in 2016. Accommodating competing human rights, it would seem, is in fact a zero-sum game. When freedoms compete, someone always wins. So now that Newman believes so intently in freedom of religion and freedom of speech, I wonder if he recognises that his vote in favour of same-sex marriage has contributed to the erosion of those very freedoms for which he now fights. This, I hope, highlights the complicated reality of freedom of speech. It's difficult to conclude that freedom of speech should be, or even can be, a primary concern because the very idea is too far gone, too far corrupted in today's world. In fact, I'll go one further and say it's actually nonsensical in today's world. It makes no sense because speech itself has lost its meaning. I agree with everything Veronica said about the power and the value and the importance of words and the logos and speech. But unfortunately, not only are we dealing with the complexity of the concept of freedom and an apparent desire for freedom, which is almost, if not entirely impossible, but we've now combined that with the fact that over the past few hundred years, Western society has embraced a philosophy which has completely eroded the meaning of words and speech itself. Last year, standing here around this time, I spoke about the impact of metaphysical nominalism in the world of education. And today, again, I'm a broken record, pointing to nominalism as one of the root causes for our freedoms devouring each other, because words have lost their meaning. For what can freedom of speech possibly mean in a world where speech is meaningless and words can change definitions on a whim? 
This is entirely what we have seen upon reflection of the last few decades. Once a sworn enemy of conservatives, Jermaine Greer now finds herself branded a trans-exclusionary radical feminist, a TERF, and may be surprised to find herself in the trenches fighting alongside conservatives in a rejection of gender theory. For the new class of ruling elite, freedom of speech actually no longer has anything to do with speech. Due to the redefining power of nominalism, freedom of speech has been transformed into freedom of will. Our modern world believes that our words have the power to shape and change reality. We have bought the satanic lie that the mind is its own place. This is how and why liberalism has become a tyranny. As James Cole writes in his book by that name, The Tyranny of Liberalism, to say there is a tyranny of liberalism is to say that a particular way of understanding political, social and moral life, one that treats freedom, equality and satisfaction of preferences as final standards, has become overwhelmingly dominant. Liberal, liberal assumptions and ideas cause social authorities to lose touch with human reality to supplant and suppress informal and traditional institutions such as the family, and eventually to overreach and become tyrannical, self-contradictory and self-destructive." This is the Ouroboros. It is self-destructive because the obsession with any form of freedom when disconnected from reality will become naturally competitive. And freedom of speech will always result in asking whose speech. Whose freedom? Take the recent exam uh, expulsion of Bernie Finn from the Liberal Party in Victoria. A more fitting example of the Ouroboros perhaps cannot be found than a Liberal Party expelling someone for exercising their liberty. It would be a worthwhile endeavour, therefore, to try to place freedom within Thomas Aquinas's hierarchy of the goods, as detailed in his Summa Theologiae. Goodness, he writes, is predicated chiefly on the virtuous, then of the pleasant and lastly of the useful. And these have become known as his three types of good, virtue, pleasant, useful. So where then should we place freedom? Perhaps it encompasses all three in that freedom is useful for achieving pleasure and virtue and it's pleasurable to exercise and live within freedom. But if we were to grant this, we must also grant that it is not negative freedom that is required for the fulfilment of virtue. Thinking of virtues such as fortitude, justice, temperance and prudence, all four of these can occur in the absence of negative freedom. That is, they can occur when obstacles to our free actions are present. In fact, one may argue that negative freedom creates an even greater opportunity for virtue, for such, uh, such as an individual who finds themselves wrongly imprisoned and thus has an increased potential to display fortitude and charity. Positive freedom, on the other hand, is required. We must have received that gift of self-mastery. We must not be beholden to animal urge or instinct or blind passion that drives us uncontrollably forward. Therefore, for freedom to be accurate, accurately located within the scope of goods, it is not negative freedom, but positive freedom that is required. What has taken place, or at least what well-meaning liberal-minded conservatives could be at risk of, is misplacing freedom, and instead of seeing it as a necessary condition for virtue, rather seeing it as virtue itself. We have inadvertently called a good thing the best thing, and we have mistaken the means for the end, and run the risk of seeing liberty and even more problematically, negative liberty, as a virtue, as a good in and of itself. And this has only resulted in the diminishing of the necessary conditions for human flourishing. We have not, it is very important to note, lost the necessary conditions for virtue, for they can never be taken from us. But we are seeing freedom obsession erode our capacity for those other goods, such as usefulness and pleasure. It's quite possible <clears throat> that those individuals that pursued freedom of speech over the last few decades have been those that paved the way for the gradual erasure of other freedoms. Writing in 2016, John Anderson noted that sadly the slavish pursuit of equality produces only slaves to equality and slaves are no longer free. 
Such is the paradox of good intention uninformed by history. Because the Luciferian vision of freedom is an impossible lie, it will always lead to further lies. As James, as James Kolb says again, quote, the incremental style of liberalism obscures the radicalism of what it eventually demands and enables it always to present itself as moderate. What is called progress, in effect movement to the left, is thought normal in present day society. So to stand in its way, let alone to try to reverse accepted changes, is thought radical and divisive. We have come to accept that what was inconceivable last week is mainstream today and altogether basic tomorrow. So what then is the solution? In Augustine's Confessions, he speaks of virtue being contained in the definition of auto amoris, that is ordered affection, ordered loves. Sin is disordered affection, loving things in the wrong way, the wrong degree, at the wrong times. In other words, in the wrong order. Freedom is a good thing. But if it is loved and pursued in a disorderly manner, it will, like all good things, become corrupted and then automatically become a vice. Freedom is not a virtue. Rather, it is a state of being that will only manifest through the virtues. Therefore, I'm arguing here for an almost entirely positive conception of liberty. Yes, we need negative liberties. But without positive liberty, those negative liberties will always enslave us. Positive liberty is that which breaks the loop of the Ouroboros and sets us truly free. The images of Satan in the ice or the driver yearning for his cigarettes illustrate that positive liberty comes from an internal freedom. It is not about rejecting limitations, but rather, counterintuitively, embracing them. This is the difference between Satan and the angels. For they embraced the limitations of servitude to God and are blessed with joy as the result. Good trade. For this is exactly what the virtues are. They are limitations which are good for us. Limitations that paradoxically set us free. Unless freedom of speech finds its place in the hierarchy of reality, unless it is surrounded by fortitude, justice, temperance and prudence, unless it is grounded in love, in love and used in the pursuit of truth, beauty and goodness, unless we endeavour not only to speak the truth but to speak the truth in love, it will result in the end doing nothing more than keeping us enslaved in hell, bringing hell with us wherever we are, creating a hell on earth. It's the divine paradox, but we must lose our life to gain it. Thank you.